So on Sunday I was working 10 hours and I did not record a video. So what I wanted to share was that um, in the Megillus Ruth, the story of Ruth, we talk about how Nomi said to her daughter, this is what Naomi says. She says, turn back in chapter one, verse 12 and 13. Turn back, my daughters, go your ways, for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they're grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it's exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She is saying Elimelech's line ended, there's no future with her, right? Because um, they left Moab. Um, you know, her name is Nomi. Pleasant, delightful, lovely. She's a foreigner in Moab. She went with her husband. She and her husband, they took their sons. They left their home in Bethlehem. He was a dignified man in an effort to survive a, a very severe famine. That's, you could read the story in Ruth 1.1. 1, 1. And then Elimelech died, and he left Nomi as a widow in a foreign land. In time, her sons took Moabite wives. This is, that was uh, Ruth 1.3 and Ruth 1.4. So this is Orpah and um, Ruth. And um, then the two sons died. So then Naomi goes uh, in chapter 1, verse 20, 21. She says, do not call me Nomi. Call me Mara, which is uh, bitter in Hebrew. For the Almighty has dealt bit, very bitterly with me, and I went away full, and the Lord brought me back empty. Why call me Nomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So in Devarim, which is Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verse 3, it says, Moab is a godless land. So think of her like this. She, you know, her sons were supposed to marry, were, were not supposed to marry Moab white woman. Her husband died, her sons died. She had these two foreign daughters. They left their place, all their possessions, everything, because of the famine. And it was a godless time where everyone did what was right in their own eyes when the judges ruled. That's what it says um, in Torah. So, Orpah took her up on it. Orpah left. It says that Orpah's child was, child's child, her, she was ancestress of Goliath, the one who David slew, who was a Philistine and used to torture and persecute Jewish people. And Ruth said, no, I'm going to follow you. I'm surrendering my life to you. And she said, your God is my God. Your people are my people. And that's the story of the first convert to the Jewish people. So they learn a lot about what it means to be a convert from Ruth. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the reasons that people convert. So one is witnessing. This is when we have attentiveness and respect. And it's inspired, I wrote this, um, it's inspired by the art therapist, Kathy Malchiotti. Um, and, and this is to be a witness, to be in the Eidos, the congregation of Israel is also to be a witness, to witness God. And some people called it the Jehovah's Witness, but that's... Um, what they're doing is saying that they're making their own new religion versus where God revealed himself already to the Jewish people on Mount Sinai. And um, another way is someone had a spiritual contact with, with what we co might call marriage magic. Sorry, not marriage, magic. But there is no way to understand this magic. They, they, they recognize its divinity. And another one is the real love, the recovering which we sell. And finally... It is that substance doesn't bring pleasure. So somebody might be looking for that long-lasting sustainability of pleasure, which they could not find in substance. So let's go through a few of them. And, and also, finally, is, is in the gut. It's like the gut instinct or the gut relaxation. Um, I'll explain a little more about that. Okay, so actually, let me start with the gut. So first of all, it's relaxing that probing, that challenging, that intaking. When we have a world that suddenly contracts, we call it symptom, it's a practice. We have to actually also sometimes do it ourselves. It's the idea that things just um, become really um, very tight. A new world is born from that. But actually in the anxious place before we break through, break free or break down, um, there's not a pushing, but like a letting out, being airy within, not needing to know or want. Um, to get to that place, we, we feel tight, like I need, like a hunger or digestion like there's something there there's like something not us we're we're chewing on or, or breaking down and sometimes life is too traumatic in other words we it takes time to really fully integrate what happened it was a shock and that's also the idea of what goes in must go out um, sometimes we prepare in advance out of love or we deliberately um we deliberate or we elaborate and this is also like not making excuse for making mistakes because it's okay 
to make mistakes. And our gut instinct sometimes will guide us the wrong way because we're misinterpreting it or we make observations with an attachment still to outcome. Like if we're okay, sometimes we're not willing to be open to, to non-attachment to outcome. Also, we don't need to earn love. Simply having a genuine interest to pay attention to the other is, um, plus, you know, making the genuine effort and taking the time to genuinely consider the other person. We recognize it does have to feel good. It's, you know, to be encouraging, um, inspiring, there's chemistry. It can't be like disturbing. It has to give us hope and enliven us and comfort us. So that's to say that when we're being used by God, even down to our gut, like like our true self, like, um, it's, it's a way of kind of getting out of our mind. What's in it for me, right? So we have to become a little bit insane and yet stay grounded that, oh, we're life with other people. I'm teaching my inner child that I can be calm because there's always some level of coming and going, some kind of coming and going, some kind of receiving and giving. It's, it's, there's a flow and not needing to get too tight holding on to any part. The next is substance doesn't bring pleasure. Um, grief is like a robber. It cuts, it's like a, it's like a cutter. It's in a spiritual excision, so there's a loss, right? And so to no longer have and, and to spring sudden things and then and rip off a band-aid can be damaging for some people, especially if the person is sensitive and to being alone or during the direct time after, because it seems that if something happens to us, everything, everyone might think we deserve it. Like she must have deserved it, right? If someone's suffering, there's that secret little idea. Maybe, um, maybe we don't want to blame the person, like some people call it victim blaming. Maybe we don't want to blame them but we do sort of feel it must be their fault or they had some role in it on some level. So this idea of like, um, there's another reason why people might want to um, become one with Hashem because Hashem keeps us company no matter, everything could come and go, substances, in other words, people, places, things, um, partners, um, objects, even sexual chemistry, which gives a reinforcement to the pro-social activities and the vulnerability exposure. Like it's worth it to be vulnerable because there's a payoff of pleasure or it's worth it to be pro-social and date and go to parties and be with people. And the potential pain of being treated too hastily, too numbly, forgetfully or distractedly, not knowing what tomorrow will bring, the future is really best left to the plan and the pattern designer, which is God. So um, another thing I mentioned was um, witnessing. So Kevin B. Parry talks about there's 10 types of magic. I just thought it was cute to, not witnessing, sorry, um, magic. Just thought it was cute to, I'll, I'll do witnessing after. Just thought it's cute to mention that, you know, for God who created the world, it's not, God conceals itself. And, uh, but there's 10 types of magic. He said there's 10 categories we could say supernatural activities belong in. One is levitation. Two is vanishing. Three is production. Four is transformation. Five is penetration. Um, production means something out of nothing. Vanish means disappearance. Transformation means something turns into something else. Penetration means something goes through something else. Um, transposition, um, it's like uh, moves location, right? Restoration, um, it's like uh, broken down and you turn it back to an earlier stage or restore it, it's ripped in pieces and you put it back together. Escape, somebody gets out of something that seems to have no escape. Teleportation which is to go from one location to another. Wait, wasn't that transposition? Oh, maybe transposition is to, shape, to change its position and teleportation is to change its location. And then prediction is you could say something now, like a prophet, right? And then it happens later. Um, I thought that was a cute thing to add, but really all those things we could say someone chooses God because they witnessed any of these miracles or what you might think is magic. Um, in terms of witnessing, inspired by the um, art therapist um, Kathy Malchiodi, um, not criti this is about attentiveness and respect. So to be a witness, right, is to not criticize, evaluate, reject, or appraise. This is not just seeing and watching, but really viewing as a process of honoring. This is our inner dialogue, our active imagination, and even in group activities, whether there's roles or parts involved, could involve unfinished business in the present or appearing. appearing. Um, it could be transferring feelings and perceptions. It could be positive and negative, love and fear, um, the persona, the anima and animus, the shadow, admiration and approval, considerations, whether we're getting those things, consideration, approval and admiration, or we're giving, um, interpretation and expression, which is personal, and movement, sounds, words, rhythms, emotions, reflecting on mode of information rather than the specific content, like the fact that someone could communicate with you with their with their movements, their words, um, the, the tonality, 
emotions that are coming through. And to be a witness, to be able to receive all these different aspects, um, even recognizing that we're having an inner dialogue while someone's talking to us, or that we're imagining things while we're looking at things, and that when we're in group activities, we might have new parts of us that are start to be nurtured in new roles, or that um, the unfinished business idea that something isn't complete, we need to finish a cycle, and or when we're in the present, or that when things appear, it's like, maybe they were there all along, we only noticed them. And obviously this transference, which a lot of people know when they've been in therapy, maybe issues with parents, or when they're in a partnership, these things can come up, the feelings, perceptions, which are good or bad, or, you know, love or, love or fear, or positive or negative, all these kind of things, um, we can learn how to bring respect into that, not just, um, oh yeah, not just as we're witnessing to evaluate it right away, like to be appraising it for value or rejecting it or criticizing it. And not just like flatly looking, but actually really viewing, like honoring its truth. And finally, real love. So um, it could be good and bad, light and dark, beauty and ugly, but there's a fullness, there's a wholeness, there's a realness there. It's, um, and I'll say different aspects to it. Harnessing abilities for inner fulfillment, prioritizing focus, reflecting, identifying on a chosen life purpose and seeing where the steps match it. That's an example of real love. And real love here being recovering the true self. So godliness that brings us in these ways where our abilities come out. We have more fulfillment. We can focus and reflect and identify our chosen life. Like basically our mission, our passion, our purpose. We can also delve into the areas that give us more self-trust, more self-esteem, longer lasting self-sufficiency, really to become um, a whole person. We can accept and process more accurate reality without distortion. So we're less uh, wounded, less uh, vulnerable to, to distortions, to to delusions, to fantasies. And there's also inner peace from a middle, like a new chart, new charts, like chosen to know ourselves. Like even um, not wanting or knowing anything specific yet, like it's okay, just facing the unknown uncertainty is the healing, even if it's triggering, that takes the charge um, out of the frustration and dissatisfaction from not being inner with reality. It's like, there's disappointments that happen when we're not really in the truth. So when we're in the truth, even if it's not exactly what we thought we wanted, we find there's an inner peace that comes. And that's when we rely on God, that the truth can't be that bad because God made it. And when we have an adjustment period, it's worth finally being in the truth and with the truth. Um, it could take us a little bit of time to actually grieve for what we thought it was and accept what it actually is. And also, this is like not, this is, specifically when we're not pretending to be always the innocent victim and avoiding responsibility by blaming and excusing or deflecting or pretending that we're ignorant or manipulating others perceptions i mean the truth itself sets us free from wasting so much energy on all those things and in fact we don't have to be a fake or pretender because others will use us if we give them the opportunity so we don't have to be someone that we're not we're actually able to be our real self and feel like okay and and worthy of, of being who we are without needing to be anyone else. And it's not real if we don't present ourselves as ourselves. There's there's a fake rep misrepresenting status which wastes our energy that we could give ourselves rather than trying to get from the outside, you know, this positive feedback or desired outcome by being someone we're not, trying too hard basically. And to be in our presence, like in the, in the right now power, instead of proving um, to someone else that we are something is to actually be rather than to show or to prove that we are, we can heal selfishness, objectifications of, of life and conscious awareness where we're like using people, we're hijacking them to like be our witness and to make us real, the person we want to be versus, and, and not wanting to show ourselves as a user, but we're actually using people for that if we're, if we're not willing to be ourselves. And I mean, also the idea of people pleasing, it only fosters resentment because we overly reside in the external appearances. We even obsess about the impressions that we're making to others and that doesn't fulfill us in an inner way. So hopefully these are some great examples on why um, uh, people do convert and why, you know, a lot of uh, what gives life meaning and purpose and peace and so on and so forth um, is possible from a godly life. And um, I'm speaking about specifically a Jewish uh, lifestyle because it's complete and as an identity and, and, and a soul, a soul path. All right, so this again, this video was for yesterday, Sunday.